Hello and welcome back to day-to-day -day chess games analysis in 15 minutes or less. Some more surprises happened today in the World Cup in Baku. Former world champion Vladimir Kramnik did not take his chance to convert this winning position. Here his opponent um, Andrekin played e4, having trying to to have a little little uh, trap here with king f3 and. Um, Kramni captured in e4, a big shock for me here, rook takes e4, because after king f3, black just has this rook g2, rook f2 perpetual, you cannot move the rook anywhere, for example, if you were to play rook to e8, I just have rook g2, and of course you cannot go to h1, unless you want to also lose the game, but uh, after king f1, it's, it's a draw. And um, here, after um, king f3, the only chance that Kramnik was able to find was rook f4, giving the exchange back and um, trying to win the rook endgame. But after knight takes, rook f1 check, simply king takes e3, and now rook c2 attacking this c5 pawn. If you don't pay attention, you're gonna remain, um, we're gonna remain equal material. g5, rook takes h6, g4, very good move, and now. The problem of white, although he has two pawns up, his problem remained. His king in g1 staying on mate uh, on the last rank or at least perpetual rook, uh, rook c1, rook c2. So eventually the game ended in a, in a draw and uh, he lost the next game against uh, Andrekin, sending him to the top 16. Um, very, very sad result for, for former world champion Vladimir Kramnik. I have a question for you. How could he have won here? I mean, not rook takes e4, but what else? Take a moment, pause the video, and try to find it yourself here. c6. c6. We have a free pass pawn. Why won't we just go for the queen? And now, king f3 idea doesn't work anymore because after king f3, we can just give rook f1 check. And of course, you cannot just play knight to f2 here because. Uh, you're going to be losing a lot of material. So after rook f1 check, king takes e3, c7, and this pawn is going for the queen. You have to play rook c2 and give the rook as well. So here, white should have no problems to win this. So after c6, um, the only way black can stop that pawn is to play rook to c2. But uh, here we play c7, attracting this rook from the second rank. Away, I mean basically distracting it because the rook here was had a lot of uh, perpetual threats uh, mating threats maybe so now we are just distracting the rook taking it away and now we take an e4 because king uh, f3 doesn't do much just rook to e6 and now uh, there's nothing there's nothing that black really can do in this position if g5 we can just give check first attack the knight to try to make it go even further from from our king and then we capture in h6 and uh, Kramnik should not have had any problems winning this so big blunder there um, and other people who um, went to the top 16 are Mike Adams he eliminated uh, Lanier Dominguez um, Grandmaster uh, Topalov is in, Svidler, So Wesley, Vashiel Lagrave, and uh, the most disputed match of these tiebreakers was uh, the one between Super Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura and um, Nepomniachi. Uh, Nakamura ended uh, the match victorious. Um, it seems that he had stronger nerves. They played nine rounds, and finally in the Armageddon game, Nakamura won the game with black. So, um, some crazy results today, and surprising, of course, as well. Uh, while all of the matches were inspiring, I finally chose the game that impressed me the most, let's say. The game between Topalov and Shengli Lu. Uh, this was a rapid game that was played. It was the first one of their match, and after this, probably, um, Shengli Lu felt already... Um, that he lost the match because uh, the next round just ended in a draw. So let's check this game out and uh, see the su superiority of Topalov and his um, how he was able to improve his the position of his pieces and basically 
uh, do nothing more than that, just uh, play a very beautiful game. e4, c5, knight f3, d6, so far so good. a6, do you guys know the name of this opening? It's not 100% sure yet, uh, maybe the Nidorf. Um, so, um, uh, Topolov played bishop e2 here. And uh, now, if we would see e5 in this position, this would be the Nidorf, okay, the Nidorf variation. If we'd see e6 and then later with b5, black would play with b5, bishop b7, fianchetto, it would be the Scheveningen. However, in this game, Lucien Gley uh, went for g6. So we see some kind of hybrid between the Nidorf and the dragon. The dragon variation would be in this position after knight c3, g6. Bishop e3, bishop g7, but what's different between, well, there's the a6 pawn, of course, but between this position and the one that happened in the game is that now white has the Yugoslav attack, which goes like this, f3, castle, and bishop g c4, and he will continue with queen g2, castle, g4, h4, h5. This is basically the Yugoslav attack, as you notice with this bishop in c4, because Okay, eventually it will go to b3 when it will be attacked, but it, it's very important to have the bishop on this diagonal because as you push the pawn h4, h5, you are going to threaten to take in g6 and um, force black to take with the h pawn, which is something he does not want to do. He always wants to take uh, in these uh, dragon Sicilians, he wants to take with the f pawn, not to open the h file to get mated. So, um, this is quite good for white. So this new hybrid system is very interesting. So because after bishop e2, white is not as ready to play the. Um, there's a move lost basically. You don't want to play bishop e2, bishop c4. Besides now b5 comes with tempo. So so Topalov played bishop e3, bishop g7, queen d2. He still wants to cast along and start some attacking on the king side. And now knight c6. Actually, in this position, I've noticed um, castle is another continuation. But um, if you're not really familiar with the dragon, you need to be very careful against these attacks. Short, I've noticed, used to play this with black. Um, castle here, and if long castle, bishop d7, bishop h6, now knight c6. And um, this would be just a very normal dragon dragon line. But uh, Liu Sheng Lei played after queen g2, knight c6. And here we can play again f3 to uh, stop any knight g4 stuff or maybe long castle. Uh, to of liked f3, if I were to play this with white, I'd probably play f3 too. You, you don't want to allow this knight g4 uh, ideas to, to take your bishop. So f3. Uh, and now, an interesting move, d5. Um, it wasn't really like bishop d7 or castle seem more natural moves in this position. It seems that there's a big, really, like a mix between a dragon, an accelerated dragon, but it's not really accelerated because black played d6. Eventually, black does want to play d5 in these uh, uh, lines to to switch the play from the from the king side to the center so that you know he doesn't get uh, mated fast but uh, d5 here doesn't seem to me as the best um, the best move for um, for black uh, maybe knight takes d4 would be another another interesting continuation um, and after bishop takes d4 bishop e6 it was a game that was played between bauer and istrotescu um, something else that was played was actually d5 here there was a game between um Ardiashach and walter brown but this was in 1970s, and after that, I haven't really seen new games here, so I don't think this is... It probably was just a preparation to play for Rapid. Uh, I would not really recommend to play this um, this with uh, with Black, but maybe maybe it's alright. Knight d7, this, this position should be okay, but 
you know, I'm not forced to take in C6, I could just take in D5 here. So, okay. This part of the opening is not my big strengths. So let's let's move on to, to see what happened in the game. E takes d5, knight d5, and now knight c6, because we want to create some weakness in, in black's position to destroy its, its uh, pawn structure. And now, of course, we don't take in d5 to help him um, bring the pawn to a very beautiful pawn structure and have a central pawn, uh, but uh, bishop d4. This is a very typical move. We are exchanging black's king protection. So bishop takes d4, somewhat forced here. Queen takes, castle, castle. Different side castling, but okay, some pieces were traded. The center is not blocked, so it's not really easy for white to start the attack. Uh, in this position, uh, queen c7, I think, would have been a better choice for, for Lucien Glay because uh, you're, you are waiting a little bit to see whether white is going to trade the knight and try to win win the pawn here, which actually wouldn't be that great for white because we have bishop e6 and then a2 is going to be hanging and you're opening up all your king's position. So if white does not capture in d5, maybe we want to capture in c3 and then bishop e6. I feel that this would have been a more natural continuation. He actually played bishop e6 immediately which uh, after queen, queen c5 seems to lead to a slightly better position for white because now you cannot trade the knights. So he played uh, queen b8 um, and now g3. This is an interesting move, stopping any kind of queen f4 stuff, but in the same time preparing for my maybe h4, h5 or f4, f5. So here again, I think knight takes e3 had to be played um, in this position. You don't want to, to keep those. This is, this is a protector of white. So if you really want to do something on the uh, king side, you have to trade the knights. And after bishop a2, b3, this, is, this was a, an idea that uh, I found. So white can actually come and get this bishop, but um, Queen e5 is a very cool move because now we're threatening to take in b3, rook a1, and of course the bishop is hanging. And the only defense for white, crazy, crazy is king d2 here. And uh, after queen a5, okay, black will have two pawns for, you have to play b4. Black will have two pawns for the piece and uh, this king in the center. So this is, this is a crazy line, but definitely worth trying in a rapid game. Uh, Lucien Glay played a5. Uh, but where is this pawn going? It's too slow, in my opinion. Now, also knight a4. So now I don't allow the trade of the of the knights, and you don't have a great square for the knight because you have to keep it there to protect e7. And now after rook d8, again, um, maybe not the best choice for black. A3. This is a nice move, you know, just stopping any queen before or knight before. But queen before in general to trade the queens. Topalov is really an attackative player, so he tries to avoid as much as possible trading of the pieces. And here, uh, maybe his opponent didn't know what to do anymore because he started weakening his king. H5. Look, if you don't know what to do, try to improve the position of your pieces, not weaken your uh, your pieces position more. This is just weakening the king. Rook d6, you know, try to double on the file, do something. H5 is just... Now rook d2, rook d1. Again, another weakening move, h4. f4, okay, we don't, if you tra trade it, we trade it back. And here uh, it was black's uh, final blunder, rook b8, which is a move where probably he should have tried to move the queen and rook much earlier, not weakening his king. And now... White is simply getting a great position. C4, good move. This knight has to go to f6. Queen e5, even better move, because you cannot trade the queens and you don't have a good square for the queen. Your rook here is hanging, and this knight is coming to c5. So as you can see, I just move the queen to bring this knight to c5. He hasn't let the knight there forever. Rook there, knight c5, and here, okay, black is just lost, but after king f5, he just lost the rook. I really hope you enjoyed this game and how Y just improved the position of his pieces and his opponent had no idea what to do and um, started weakening his, his position. Stay tuned for more tomorrow. 
Have a great day. Bye.